hello. Today I'm going to be looking at some questions that have been coming up in the True Sidereal group. Um, this is from Cosmic Human Design Facebook. And uh, it's, I believe it's fair use to include these questions um, and from an academic perspective. Of course, if anyone um, has a question included here that they wish to receive credit for, please just post in the comments or, or private message me and I will add credit for the question because I absolutely want uh, people to be happy with um, getting recognized and, and so on for their questions. All right, so the first question, what is the function of the tropical zodiac? Is it just the ego's design? So it's asking, is the tropical zodiac the ego? Um, you know, this is a, this question, so is the tropical zodiac used for the design of the ego? The design of the ego, I mean, this is a, an idea that has gone around for many years in many different forms that there is a particular design for the ego that's different than the design of the unconscious or a particular um, way the ego is that's different from the unconscious, right? So, for instance, some people say the Myers-Briggs typology system is for the conscious mind, other in that Enneagram is for the unconscious. Others have reversed this and have said that the Enneagram actually shows how the conscious mind works and that the Myers-Briggs is showing how the unconscious functions with the brain system and so on. Um, people like Dario Nardi have shown that actually there are both conscious and unconscious aspects to Myers-Briggs and it's actually showing something more like uh, preferences for cognitive functions. Um, Eric Strauss has preferred the model of, um, has proffered the model of the attentional hierarchy that we pay attention, you know, to things that are more easily consciously accessible to us and that we it gets more and more expensive to spend attention uh, for the unconscious. So really the ego versus the unconscious, this is a kind of an old trope. And it's the, I do think that there is something to it, right? I mean, like I was talking about last time, how there are fractal lines. You get metaphors of metaphors of metaphors. So just like the metaphor of the return of the feminine is explained in human design as the right variable in the nine-centered being and so on. Um, similarly, I think that this metaphor of the difference between the conscious and the unconscious mind. This is something you see again and again and again, um, at, at, you know, as you, as you move, move farther from the human design material, which it's so interesting because even before human design emerged, it was kind of in the ether, if you will. This idea of the division between the conscious and the unconscious, in fact, um, Nietzsche was the first one to really codify this, or at least to explore it, and then with Freud and Jung, and, and so obviously there was a real buildup, this burgeoning understanding that actually even harkens back to the Phoenicians, but it's somewhat like a lost knowledge. It harkens back to the idea of two souls, and the Phoenicians would have two burial rites, you know, one for the conscious, one for the unconscious. Or, I don't mean to reduce the conscious simply to the ego either, but that's kind of what I, how I take this question. Because people use the term ego and conscious interchangeably, but of course if you read the definition of ego, the seat of identity, and so on, as it's conventionally used, um, you know, that, well, for one thing, in human design, we split between the G center and the heart center, and the heart center is really the ego, so the, the G center is actually much more like what Freud's ego was. But on the other hand, the other point is simply that the ego is not conscious in psychoanalysis. The ego is partly conscious, and there are aspects of the ego that are not conscious as well. So I, I think just, you know, setting a little context, but at least at the general kind of broad stroke of what's the difference in the ego or the conscious, we can say, and the unconscious. And could it be that the tropical zodiac is really showing us a map of the conscious mind and the conscious personality and all the stuff that we're kind of aware of, which would be why we recognize ourselves so easily in the tropical zodiac, if that were true. And then that the sidereal is actually the unconscious or the latent or dormant. And other people use other, other kind of euphemisms for this, um, the holistic and so on. Okay, <clears throat> well, there's a lot of problems with this. First of all, people don't recognize themselves in the tropical zodiac. So if it was something that was conscious, if it was the conscious design, you would think people would just immediately go, oh yeah, that's me, obviously. And the unconscious is something we have a very hard time seeing ourselves in. In fact, we don't see ourselves in it at all. It's not us. It's not what we identify with. What we're actually finding is the exact opposite. What we're finding is a lot of people in the sidereal zodiac who are saying, I don't see myself in the tropical at all. So we can say right off the bat, it's certainly not 
that the tropical applies to the conscious or the ego or that it's somehow easier to recognize yourself. It's not. So we can say right off the bat that we can strike that. Um, the other question would just be, what is it when we're talking about a conscious design versus an unconscious design? Well, this was my major epiphany in coming to human design is that I'd been an astrologer for 20 years. I mean, since I was a teenager, I'd been studying astrology as deeply as I could. And I'd studied with some of the masters of astrology and a direct lineage. You know, I'm talking about Rick Tarnas and people like that who I've communicated with and studied and been a part of their circles and all of this. And what I found was no matter how good their narratives are about the unconscious, when it actually comes to the characterization, you know, the reason Rick Tarnas's astrology works so well is because he's always talking about the, the given period of time, what was obvious in that period of time, and what was expressed in that period of time, and what was manifest in that period of time. And he doesn't even do, I mean, he, he will try to characterize Hillman, for instance, James Hillman, using astrological analysis, but that's not Tarnas's big thing. But the more he does, or the more any of these often brilliant astrologers go into the character of someone with individual astrology, they are so insightful and they are so good at describing that person, and yet they're describing that person's personality. So Rick Tarnas can talk for four hours about James Hillman and go in depth about his sun and moon and Aries and how he's a solar hero for the lunar and about his Neptune square Saturn and all of these different positionings and so on. And it will be true, and it will be accurate, and it will perfectly describe Hillman's personality. So in that sense, then, am I not contradicting myself? Is it not the case that tropical zodiac is the description of the ego? No, absolutely not. The birth time is the personality. The birth, the natal chart. What human design gives us is the world's first map of the unconscious, or at least the world's first map that maps the unconscious with the exact same precision of the conscious. In other words, when you're looking at your human design, the personality and the design, I can give a reading for someone and talk about their personality all day, and they'll go, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. And I can give a reading and tell them about their design, and they'll say, I have no idea who you're talking about. I'm nothing like that. I don't have anything to do with that. So the design is already alien from the ego. It's already, we are already alienated from ourselves. It's as if we have two people inside of us. And the one of them is the one doing the talking and doing the thinking and doing, you know, the one of them is the one that feels like 100% of the being. And it's actually only 50% of the being. And this 50%, the personality, comes with the other 50%, the design, and they come together and create something greater than the sum of the parts, which is the synthesis of the two, the juxtaposition. So I guess what I'm saying is when the question asks, you know, when, when, when the questioner asks, is the tropical the conscious? No, the personality is the conscious. So both conventional human design as well as true sidereal cosmic human design are both claiming to show you the conscious and the unconscious and the synthesis of the two. That's what the body graph is. Both are making the same claim. Ra and human design and International Human Design School and me and people of this first generation of human design are, or second generation or however you want to look at it, are all making the claim that we are showing you both your ego, conscious personality, all of that, as well as the design side, the unconscious, the body's consciousness and so on. So we're already making that claim. Now, you can say we're wrong and that's fine and you can try to demonstrate why we're wrong and I would encourage that, especially for third lines. I'm always encouraging third lines to find problems with human design. However, so many third lines are ashamed of their mistakes, and they don't show anyone their mistakes, and they're not willing to say, look, I thought this might work, but it didn't. Instead, they try to find mistakes in what's already out there, and to try to say something else is a mistake. And that's not what the third line's here to do. The third line's not here to say, Jonah, you made a mistake when you did that. The third line is here to say, Jonah, I made a mistake when I did that. And by making those mistakes, they can improve the system and so on. So already, human design is saying, here's the ego. I mean, it's the heart center, you know. Here's the conscious part of the ego. Here's the unconscious part of the ego, depending on if you have conscious activation there or not. Here's the conscious personality. Here's the unconscious. Here's how they relate to each other. 
here's what they, happens when they come together as a synthesis and when they create something greater than the sum of the parts. And then true sidereal human design is saying the same thing. I mean, de facto, not explicitly, but by showing a chart that has a personality and a design, you are showing a chart that has both a conscious and an unconscious aspect. So then the next question would be, then, is the true sidereal more accurate for the design? Right? Is the true, is the true sidereal calculation the correct number of degrees off? Because there's a premise in human design that the 88 degree separation between the personality and the design is a constant in, in the universe. You could write down, you know, right now on February 19th, Friday, February 19th, 2021 at 1138 AM in mountain time, exactly what's going on in the world. And approximately 88 days from now, it would come to fruition or it would emerge as the next step. In other words, according to the human design mythos and cosmology, uh, the world is in a continual churning where it takes around 88 days for the latent or the dormant seeds to grow into plants, you know, to, or to blossom. So already human design is giving us a mechanism by which the unconscious becomes conscious. It's giving us a worldview where we see the latent dormant potentials emerge. And it's giving it to us in our chart where it shows us both the personality and the design. And that is the conscious and the unconscious. So back to the original question. What is the function of the tropical zodiac? Is it just the ego's design? No, no, it's, it's not. It's um, the, the tropical zodiac functions as a referent point for the ecliptic. I mean, it's, it's a taxonomy. It's a naming convention. That's what it is. And we do get the design of the ego as well as the design of the rest of the consciousness as well as the design of the unconscious. And this is what human design gives us. And this is what true sidereal also claims to give us. And they're both claiming to give us the same thing. And it's up to you to determine, you know, which, which is correct. And there are people that would say both can be correct. Sure. In many cases, both can. In other cases, they can't. For instance, you know, Avicenna said, for anyone who disagrees with the law of non-contradiction, let me set them on fire, and they can tell me how they were both on fire and not on fire at the same time. The law of non-contradiction can be violated. I'm a dialetheist. I studied under Graham Priest. And if you are interested in non-contradiction or in dialetheism or in paradoxical thinking, paradoxical logic, stuff like you find in G. Spencer Brown's Laws of Form, where indicators re-enter their own indicational space, such as this statement is false, which cannot be a statement that can ever be determined as true or false. I am absolutely, in, I love these, this kind of thinking. But when somebody says to me, couldn't it be that true sidereal is true in one sense and human design is true in the other? You know, true sidereal human design may have some validity in this sense and tropical conventional human design may have other validity in other sense. Yeah, but if that's the case, it's up to you to prove it. It's not up to me to prove it. And until it's proven, there's no reason to believe that I can be both on fire and not on fire at the same time, right? But, but it's up to us. I shouldn't even say prove. Um, and in Deleuze's magnificent work, one of his mag magnum opuses, really, um, where his most direct confrontation with Lacan, the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, in The Logic of Sense, shows how we can resolve contradictions through constructing senses. For instance, if I said I'm both on fire and not on fire, it could very well be that I've accidentally set a piece of clothing on fire, but another part of me is not on fire. So in one sense I am on fire, in another sense I'm not. Or maybe there is no physical fire. And so in the sense that I'm not on fire, I'm not physically inflamed, but I am on fire metaphorically because I'm on fire with love, for instance. So Deleuze really lays it all out of how if you're going to say that something and its opposite both work, or if you're going to say that something and its opposite are both true, that it's up to you to construct the sense in which it is true, right? Construct the sense in which true sidereal is true. And to construct this sense requires effectively creating a world. The same way that to demonstrate the senses in which human design is true, 
you must understand certain things about the human design cosmology and the human design world and how the neutrinos flow and how the neutrinos go through the 16 faces of the Godhead, which are 16 equidistant divisions along the celestial equator, which surround the planet and in in the globe in basically a sheath of personality crystals and how these crystals of consciousness filter the neutrinos from the distant stars and on and on and on. So my point is simply, it may very well be the case, I have, I've seen no evidence of it whatsoever, but it may very well be the case that true sidereal human design or some form of altered sidereal zodiacal calculation has some bearing or some relevance or some use. But for that to happen, it has to construct a world first. And to construct that world, the world of sense, the, the sense that it's true requires you know, a certain amount of diligence in, you know, it, these are great questions. When I, when I answer a question like, is the, ego, is the ego's design shown through the tropical zodiac human design chart? That's a great question. I mean, we need to be thinking about these things. I come up with the answer, no, because we've already been given, you know, I, I, I guess my, my point is simply, I'm not discouraging this type of research. What I'm doing is I'm holding it to a certain standard. And that standard is the same standard Deleuze holds for people to construct a sense that something is real. It's the same standard I would hold a friend to who said, I'm on fire right now. I would say, explain yourself, because I don't see any flames. And they'd say, oh, I'm madly in love with someone. And I would say, aha, now I get it. And so that same standard, if someone in true sidereal says, I used to be a manifester, now I'm a generator, I would say, in what sense? It's as simple as that. The same as, you know, or someone says, I'm both a manifester and a generator. I'm a manifester in this sense, and I'm a generator in that sense. I would say, okay, well, what is the difference in the senses? Because the human design sense is the physical, is the design, is the physical, material, the aura, the life force energy. I could be a generator in the real sense and a manifester in the imaginary sense. I mean, is that what you're talking about? No, I don't think so. I think people are saying I'm both a generator in the real sense and a manifester in the real sense. But they're different kinds of real senses. So it's up to the true sidereal folks to discover what that sense is. Now, my suspicion and what I've, what I've been kind of, you know, really urging, I did a video on this last night, is that the people who, who are validating their true sidereal chart are validating it with a methodology that I disagree with. They're validating it based on their ability to see themselves in it. And because they see themselves in it, it is taken as true. And that's not the yardstick of human design. I don't see myself in my design. I've learned to see myself in my design, some of it. And I've also learned to see myself through my sacral responses, which have radically surprised me. And you, you can't see in the design. You really can't see the person in the design. You can't see the generator's actual sacral response in the design. You can't see what they will really respond to. You can't predict who I'm gonna fall in love with from a design, you know? You can predict where the electromagnetic is. You can predict where the not self is going to suffer. You can predict where the hope and the pain wave is going to be. You can predict all of this, but you cannot predict who's correct for me. You cannot predict what I should be eating. You cannot predict when I should go to sleep, what I should use my energy for, right? So. So I think one of my biggest critiques thus far has just been the methodology of validation. And yet I am charitable because I understand that, you know, validation doesn't happen overnight and a lot of people exploring their true sidereal are essentially creating buckets that they are then going to track in their metaphysical research program and kind of see what's valid and what isn't. So, you know, I'm all in favor of that. That's, that's not what any of this is about. I'm trying to hold the, the true sidereal human design researchers to a certain standard of intellectual honesty. And I'm trying to do it in a charitable way because I believe in, in the, the charitable nature of anyone who is undergoing any metaphysical research program. And so in that spirit, I like to return that charitable nature to them. And yet, I'm going to continue to investigate these questions. I mean, these are questions that are coming up and I find that some of the, the questions, while great questions, are, you know, th this, was a, this question was not intellectually dishonest. 
there are some intellectually dishonest questions out there. And I will be addressing some of those as well. This was a very sincere question, and I, I really liked this question because I think it touches on a very hot topic, uh, not just about true sidereal versus human design, but about the whole idea of the unconscious and of the map of the unconscious. This is the kind of the biggest point of contention I have with conventional astrologers, is I tell them, oh yeah, astrology works. And they say, well, why would you do human design then if astrology already works? And I said, well, for one thing, astrology is seven-centered. It's ancient. It has a lot of baggage that we don't really need in our common day. But besides that, the bigger reason, well, and also the lack of precision, but the bigger reason is just it only shows you your personality. It's only showing you what you're showing the world in a way. And I've had astrologers disagree with that. They've said, no, actually, it's the uh, whole sign house systems that uh, show you sort of the ascendant and the the chart of the ascendant and that when you use other house systems, you're actually getting the more psychological perspective and this and this and this. Um, I don't buy it, you know? I mean, yeah, you're getting the psychological. There's an interiority to the conscious mind as well. You know, the conscious mind has both an interior and an exterior, just as the unconscious does. So I'm not saying that astrology can't show you the interior of your consciousness. I'm just saying that what you are conscious of what you think is you is the passenger. But there's also something else, someone else, that you might not recognize is also you. And the, the tropical zodiac is not just showing you the ego. I mean, it is when you're only calculating the natal chart from the tropical zodiac. But the tropical zodiac itself is not related to the ego, it's related to the earth. It's related to the sheath of the 16 personality crystal bundles that envelop the earth. It's related to the wheel, the hexagram wheel, right? So, you know, keeping, the, keeping that in mind, understanding the context, something I really like to do is just bring in a lot of context. I can't really answer a question until we, uh, until we have the context. In fact, there's a wonderful quote I think I'll end on um, by Charles Babbage. And uh, let me find it, the question. And the question that was asked to Mr. Babbage was, pray, Mr. Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out? To which Mr. Babbage replied, I am not able rightly to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. And I think that that's, it's important still to try to untangle those questions. It's important to, to, in Deleuze's words, trace the genesis of the mistake. It's not enough to say something's wrong. You have to show exactly where it went wrong, exactly why it went wrong. You have to almost give an alternative or a redemptive critique of the thing that says, I see why the mistake, I see that the mistake had the best intention. I see that the final cause of the mistake was still valid even though the efficient cause, or however you want to call it, wasn't. And, and I think that this is a redemptive move. You know, I am tempted with Babbage to say, I cannot rightly apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. And yet, my better nature typically wins out, and I come to the conclusion that there are no bad questions. Or rather, there are bad questions, but there are no bad reasons for asking the question. Thanks for watching.